Oh, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. The podcast. Man, it feels good that the weather's starting to get a little colder. That means basketball season's coming up. I'm looking forward to coaching this year for basketball. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to college basketball. I love watching the college game. I'm more a fan of the pro sports, in particular the basketball season, usually starting like right after Halloween or right around Halloween. So you're right, you know, this time of year, it's like it's time for basketball. Yeah, the Nuggets have a countdown on their like, uh, social media page, and they'll just show a different jersey each day. So we're less than 30 days until uh, basketball starts. So I'm looking forward to that. Well, I do like watching some NBA games. College, to me, is more pure because they actually remember what defense is. They actually play as a team. They, you know, build and work together. So I love the NBA for, like, the high-flying dunks, a lot of, like, a lot of points, the movement of the ball. But there's so many travels. There's so many, like, tic tac fouls that it just, I don't like it anymore. And in college basketball, you get that, like, energy, you mm-hmm. know? It's like you got the whole college and college town behind you. Oh, you know, I, people that aren't even sports fans all of a sudden are, you know, fanatics and, like, screaming and painting their faces. And and it's, I mean, you can feel it. That's, uh, what's see here? I was in the newspaper and on TV for an Iowa State game day. So Iowa State Cyclones played the Kansas Jayhawks. Anyone familiar with Big 12 basketball? Huge rivalry. I was there. We won. It was awesome. Nice. Just that that energy, that electric, like electricity in the Hilton Coliseum where Iowa State plays is just awesome. And I, like I said, you I've been to NBA games and they're fun. Uh huh. But that college just is at a different level different feel completely and i think that's why march madness is so special but i think we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit no yeah march madness is that tournament that basically every time i predict i go way wrong i it doesn't matter how much research i do how many games i watch i go way wrong but one prediction that i think every single person got a hundred percent right came back in 1992. Do you know what I'm talking about? 92? I mean, I don't remember by the years, but it was probably Duke. Duke? Well, oh, I was just going in basketball in general to kind of segue into what we're talking about today. But yeah, Duke winning a lot. Oh, I thought you were talking about college championship (laughs) winner. Uh, But yeah, I mean, in 1992, you could guess who's going to be the champions of the world. Is that what you're referring to? A.K.A. The Dream Team. The Dream Team. Our topic for today, because when we're talking about these Olympics, one of the biggest changes happened in your lifetime where they allowed NBA players to play in the Olympics. And it was strange because, you know, growing up, I had gotten used to the college players representing and they fought hard just like they do, uh, you know, uh, college basketball players are also excellent players but it got to the point like you were saying in the last episode that we weren't winning all the time well let's set the scene it's 1988 usa basketball just got the bronze in the summer games in south korea not good this is the lowest finish for the united states basketball in a long time and in 88 we had some pretty good players on that team now they were college players but they were still future nba stars so the powerhouses, you, the Soviet Union and the Yugoslavia, win gold and silver respectively. And they were professional players. The quotes is basically for un, officially they weren't, but unofficially they were. <laughs> yeah, they're pros. And so when we look at 1988, that's when David Stern and USA Basketball, so two different entities, kind of looked at each other and were like, We need to do something. We need to figure out how to make basketball our gold medal every year. Yeah, because, I mean, it feels like if the other nations and countries are putting their best basketball players out there, you know, maybe we should consider the same thing. And you got to remember, at this point in the NBA 
history, there's not a lot of foreign players in the NBA. That's right. Maybe one or two. Yeah, they're very limited. They stay at their own home to play basketball there instead of coming to the United States. So the following year in 1989, we, as the United States, looked at it and declared NBA players are allowed to play. So now it's basically, it's payback time. Let's go. And that's a that's a big deal. Uh, you know, NBA teams are taking a bit of a risk, NBA players, because that's their livelihood. They're professionals. You know, if they uh, sustain a career-ending injury in the Olympics, you know, they might be out some cash. Uh, and that team that they play for in the NBA might be out some cash. We'll talk about an instant in a little bit about one of those instances where you're like, oh, we owe some apologies to NBA fans and an NBA team. <laughs> but the next two years, so from 89 to 91, the selection committee starts thinking. No one's making any official decisions because the games aren't until 1992. But first, you have to find that person who's going to lead them, that coach. And who do they pick? Chuck Daly. Yeah, Chuck Daly, uh, for those of you that don't know, was an excellent coach. Before someone like uh, Phil Jackson, Chuck Daly uh, was winning championships with the Detroit Pistons, uh, a.k.a. the Bad Boys. Yeah, so he won the 1989 and the 1990 NBA championships. So back-to-back -back and right before the selection committee. So everyone's looking at him as, well, you're a really, really good coach you can handle egos because the team definitely well they were called the bad boys everyone at that point was doing the exact same thing so the pistons were just better at it um you're like you're you've got a lot of characters on these pistons teams so you can probably handle 12 nba stars because they're going to pick the best of the best but so they asked chuck he's like i'm in let's go yeah, and I think that was an excellent choice. He was just kind of an all-business sort of coach and had a lot of respect around the NBA. No, yeah, he was, like I said, probably one of my favorite coaches the more I learn about him. And he was able to get those players to work together. Yeah, which, uh, like Langle said, isn't going to be easy. You know, you might look at them like a bunch of divas, you know, and they're stars. And you got to remember, today, a lot of NBA players are friends off the court. Back then, it was, we're like, it's just separate. We're separate teams. We're not as a collective NBA. It's me and my team, you and your team. We might be friendly off, but we're not friends. Yeah, it was more intense rivalries because there's less friends teaming up in free agency mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, keeping those off-court relationships. They're more like enemies. <laughs> All right, so imagine you're on the Olympic Committee. It's 1991, and you have to come up with the best basketball team possible of United States citizens. Who's the first person you're going after? Jordan. Jordan, without a doubt. And so they are calling him up. His phone is buzzing, but Jordan just won the 1991, and he will go on to win the 1992 championship, and he's tired. He wants that offseason to golf, to relax, to not play basketball. And so he's like, who are you getting on the team? Because in all the things I've read and learned, it's just he was down to be an Olympian, but he was already one. He won gold back when he was in college. So he was like, well, I don't really want to spend another summer. And so he's like, when you've got more of a team, come back to me. And so who the next person they go to is probably the face at the NBA of the 1980s. Oh, I was going to say somebody else, uh, but that would have been my Magic next Johnson. Guess. Yeah. Magic Johnson. I mean, he's that smiling guy that every, he, if you're going to need someone to sell other people to join, Magic Johnson's your guy. You're yeah. probably going to say Larry Bird, weren't you? I was going to say Larry Bird because there's that whole Jordan Bird dynamic, like, you know, two of the best players in the NBA. And of course, Magic was too. But here's the thing, like, if you're going to try to convince everyone else to come in, magic, magic. Bird is going to be at the great look at me, this is awesome type of thing. But in 1991, when they're picking, both of those guys were kind of at the end of their careers. Yeah. Magic just tested positive for HIV. And so he was forced to retire from the NBA. 
mm-hmm. but he stayed in good shape. He worked really hard. They were able to uh, modify the rules for blood on the court. And they're like, you know what? If you don't have a problem with playing Magic, you can still be on the team. So he's in. And Larry Bird at this time, he injured his back, um, paving the driveway for his mom. And then he just never healed. So he was just constantly in back pain, constantly back injuries. So while Bird was on the team, he wasn't Larry Legend like people know him. Yeah, Larry Legend was no longer. And so after you get Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, the dominoes start to fall. Michael Jordan says, yes. Scottie Pippen's, I'm in. Then they go to the Utah Jazz and get probably one of the best duos in history, John Stockton and Carl Malone. Yeah, very underrated. And then you're like, well, we need a big guy. Well, the big guy I would pick, Patrick Ewan, David Robinson. Boom, boom, just two big guys like that. And with the... And, you know, can I just say really quick, you know, uh, people are more familiar with Patrick Ewing. He's kind of a legend in the NBA. And he was kind of getting a little bit older at that point. But David Robinson, short career, but at that point, he was up and coming. And he was called the Admiral because of his military career. He uh, put up some of the best games and the best numbers, had some of the best seasons I'd ever seen. He he is one of those underrated guys because he played for the Spurs. Because all the Spurs do or did was constantly win. Constantly win, go to the championship, and do it in the most fundamental way. Kind of boring. I mean, it, for basketball purists, I love it. Mm-hmm. But for entertainment factor, wow factor, no, yeah, they're not going to blow a team out. They're just going to not make a mistake and just win. Yeah, and Tim Duncan gets a lot of that credit. And David Robinson was really the one that kind of started it a little bit. Yep. And he was the beginning of the Twin Towers, as they used to be referred. Yep, yep, yep. And with N- uh, NBA rules, the three-point line is farther back than international rules. Oh, yeah. So the next person they're kind of looking at is who's a deep threat? Who's someone who can constantly knock down the three? Who's someone we can have spread the floor? My first thought goes to Reggie Miller. I'm a big Reggie fan. Being Iowa, he was Indiana Pacers. He was still kind of young at that point, still not dominant Reggie. So they go to Chris Mullen. Oh, yes, Chris Mullen. Run TMC. Yeah. He was basically, if you wanted a good person to have on your team, someone you know was not going to get in trouble, someone who's going to work really hard, gel well with others, he was your guy. Very hard worker, very dedicated to basketball and making himself better. So he gets to be on the team because he's a great outside shot. And, yeah, that's back when the NBA was more specialized. Uh, Almost all NBA players have an NBA uh, good shot now. But Mullen, uh, that was his specialty, was just shooting. And you needed that on NBA teams at that point. Yeah, his just no-quit attitude and his shot was perfect for him and his teams. And then the final of the first 10 was a controversial just because I don't know any other words. But Charles Barkley. Okay. But you got to remember, at this point, the round mound of rebound. <laughs> Sir Charles. Like, had spit on a couple fans. He's elbowing everybody. He got put in jail in Milwaukee for getting in a fight. Yeah. You know, like he, he had all sorts of issues. He had, he had some reputations that NBA basketball players were like, well, or not basketball players, but the Olympic Committee was like, do, can we trust him? Can Do we want to put him out to the world? Now, obviously, he was he's a pretty worldwide name, but can we do that? So they talked to him. He said, I'm in. I'm I'll not behave. In. Yeah. yeah. Basically, <laughs> long story short, he's like, I'm, I'll behave. Binky's cr- like, fin- uh, cross my heart, that type of stuff. And so he made the team, and it was a great decision because he dominated for the dream team. And so that was the first 10. There's still like two more spots. You have to have 12 for the Olympic team. What are these 12 going to be? And so they're looking around, looking around, and they choose Clyde Dretschler. A little, not controversy, but a little people question that one because you're like, you already have Michael Jordan. Why would you get Clyde? Because they're basically 
the same, just at different tiers. Yeah, Clyde Drexler was like the poor man's Jordan. Mm -hmm. Still great, but you already had Michael. But he fit in well at that team. He was ready to go. He was a great pick. I mean, all these people are great picks. And then they decided, you know what, we need one non-professional player. I don't know why they didn't go all 12, but I think they were like, we can't just eliminate college completely. Yeah, I think that's why. And so they're just kind of in that mode of, we need one good, or one of the best college players. So who was the best college player at that time, Langle? Christian Leitner. Yep. So Shaq was considered. So Shaquille O'Neal for LSU at the time was being looked at. But you got to remember, this is not their pro careers. This is their college careers. Yeah, who was the better college player? And Shaq was dominant. In 1992, Leitner had been to the, like four Final Fours, two championships, just the guy on Duke campus, and Duke was the team in college basketball. So he was basically larger than life. Yeah, absolutely. And so they are now got their team. The captains, they kind of teased it to Jordan, but he's already, he's not wanting to be the star. He doesn't, he just wants to kind of go into summer, win the tournament, move on. So you give it to the two old dogs, Magic and Bird. There you go. So they, they co captain this and they kind of just built upon him. So some of you guys at this point, if you know uh, old school basketball players, might think something's missing. Yep. My next so, one. Missing anyone? <laughs> missing anyone. Yeah. I mean, the coach is Chuck Daly. Who might we be missing? Well, I go, when I build a team, mm -hmm. because I'm where I grew up, I'm short, mm -hmm. I want to build it around that point guard. Yeah. Point guard, center are the two things I really want to build my team around. Well, your centers are Ewing, Leitner. Robinson, you can even have Carl Malone and Barkley play big down there. So I'm like, you've got a good center. Yeah, you got some good bigs. And now you got to go point guard. And when I look at my point guards, Magic. Well, okay, one of the greatest ever, if not the greatest ever point guard. So Absolutely. But he's also old, and you don't know how the disease is affecting his game. Retired. Retired. And then the other one is John Stockton, who actually breaks his leg in the Olympics. Or, no, American qualifiers. So he, he was in a cast for a while. So you're like, well, okay. Now, of course, a lot of other players can play point guard, especially looking at all that list. There are almost everyone there could play some type of point guard. True. But in the late 80s, early 90s, the probably the best point guard, in my uh, humble opinion, was Isaiah Thomas. Isaiah Thomas played for the bad boys, played for Chuck Daly, best friends with Magic Johnson. Yeah. So what gives? Well, the Michael Jordan rules. In yep. the NBA, it's the Michael Jordan rules and everyone else. And so he just like, throughout the time, he got, he was butthurt about something years ago where it said Isaiah, led the team to free or the all-star team to freeze out the rookie jordan which i'm like if that's true get over it you're a rookie or two you've made plenty of all-star games who cares and but he took it personally and this if you watched any of the uh last dance documentaries when he takes it personally he doesn't let it go no but then again the detroit pistons were like we're not going to let jordan beat us if you're going to come into our paint we're going to hit you and at the time, that was perfectly legal. That's what they used to do. That's why they're the bad boys. Too. And like I said, a lot of people, especially Bulls fans, are like, the Pistons are the worst. Every team did it. Mm -hmm. The Pistons, like I said, were just better at it. <laughs> yeah. Like, they had Bill Lambeer. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, done. Right there. So Isaiah, who made a Hall of Fame career, at this point was definitely recognized as a great player, was considered... And I think Chuck would probably have vouched for him. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, the committee's like, our options are Michael Jordan or Isaiah Thomas. Yeah, because I think at this point, if uh, Thomas is on the team, Jordan's out. No, yeah, he would have been out so quick. Because they hated each other. Well, more so, I think Jordan wouldn't let it go. Uh, yes. His beef with yep, Isaiah. Yeah, big time. When we look at Isaiah, he definitely, like, is the... Did he do some things? Yes. He deserved some of the downfall, the 
criticism. Yeah, the criticism, yes. But you also have to remember it's a team sport. He had other players and stuff like that. And so when we look at it, Isaiah was left off the team. But in the long run, it didn't change anything. Absolutely not. I mean, their ultimate goal was gold. And uh, do you think they're going to be able to do it without Isaiah? Oh, they could have, at this point, we can kind of like pivot around because I like it. At this point, they could have picked almost any 12 NBA players and been fine because the two biggest rivalries, the only two countries Americans thought that could affect United States gold was the Soviet Union and the Yugoslavia, Mm -hmm. two great basketball powerhouses. But in 1991, the Soviet Union collapses. Mm-hmm. So now it's not the conglomerate of nations that it once was. It's now Russia. Mm-hmm. And so they lose a lot of their athletes to other countries. And Yugoslavia starts going into a civil war, and they break up. And instead of having a dominant Yugoslavian team, the next team that's worrying the United States is Croatia with Tony Kukoc. Yeah, Tony Kukoc. And... If you've seen any documentary, Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen definitely did not, were not. I mean, I think it was basically their force and will of, you are not going to do well against us. <laughs> yeah. Um, Tony Kukoc was an up-and-comer uh, European player, mm-hmm. and he was compared to the NBA players. And, you know, some people were starting to say, hey, this guy's like the future. And, mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. NBA players are like, no. Nope. And to make it worse for the Bulls is they just won back-to-back championships and their general manager is trying to get in other players, which not bad. But the way he's talking about it is this dude's way better than the team he already has. And so they took it personally. Yeah, so I think that they wanted to make their point when they played against Tony Kukoc there. All right, we've been going for 20, 25-ish minutes and we're at a natural stopping point where we can say we can go through the only loss the dream team ever experienced or we can end it here and leave a little teaser about what's coming up next uh i say we leave a little teaser and uh i don't want to do spelling with langle this week but i do want to do a little this or that with you um because we were talking about all these great players and, uh, you know, let's compare some players that, you know, were on the team and the, against players that didn't make the team, maybe. So uh, who would you pick? But before we go into this or that, the okay. little teaser. Okay, the teaser. So next time on the podcast, the Dream Team dominated, won every game, but won. Let's find out next time. Ooh. Who did they lose to? Is that the teaser? Yeah. Interesting. Ooh. Uh, one of our kids is going to look. <laughs> the Lardo's probably out there. Like, he's Googling it. Uh, so, uh, this or that, who would you pick? Uh, let's go Biggs at first. Uh, and I love Patrick Ewing, but there's an NBA center that I actually like a little bit more. And I, I, I love uh, David Robinson. But my favorite center at that time period, and there's a reason why he wasn't on the Olympic team, uh, who would you pick, Akeem Olajuwon, my favorite center of all time, or Patrick Ewing? See, here's the thing, and the problem is, I'm thinking about who do I have around him. Uh huh. I'm going with if you had to just pick, pick somebody to start, start your own my, NBA start my franchise, franchise, I would almost say Akeem or Hakeem Olajuwon. And here's why. Because Patrick Union, Union, Ewing is awesome and deserves his Hall of Fame career. He had deserved a championship, let's be real. Elijah Wan had that, maybe, I'm, and I'm stereotyping just because I don't know these people. Mm-hmm. Elijah Wan seemed to be able to that more friendly, build that team in, where Ewing was just kind of like that valiant leader. So mm-hmm. both great styles. But I kind of like that team bringing in, we all working together type of thing instead of, follow me, I've got this, yeah. because Elijah Wan was able to win a couple of championships and have that um, karamity with those players and build, okay, I'm having an off night, it's your turn, it's your, you know, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And the Knicks are just the Knicks, so they 
always run out of luck for Ewing too. Yeah. So I would say Olajuwon because, well, Patrick Ewing, Ewing, wow, Patrick Ewing would beat you on strength almost every time. Like he was just a beast. Ewing or Olajuwon had some more moves, and I think I liked the yeah. more move set because near the end. Ewing was kind of getting older, kind of like body with the wears and tears, so he wasn't able to dominate as much. Okay. Um, now let's go small forwards. We'll go with somebody on the Dream Team. Larry Bird. Would you pick Larry Bird or somebody that was not on the Dream Team, Dominique Wilkins, uh, to, to put onto Ooh. your team? And this is peak at the peak of their career. At the peak. At the peak. Dominique Wilkins, a.k.a. the human highlight reel. And that's probably, once again, either choice, you're winning games, right? Absolutely. I think how I would build my team, because while I like flashy things, I'm also, we get down to work. Yeah. And I think Larry's work ethic, and Larry was not, I mean, he trash-talked, he... uh wasn't really showboaty, but he wasn't like, or he had the showboatness, but wasn't all showboat. And so I liked, and not saying like Dominique, and that's my problem. Like, I don't want to criticize Wilkins because he's awesome. It's just that every single game, you knew exactly what Larry was going to do, and no one could stop it. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's the truth. There's a reason why he was Larry Legend. And he was like 6'10", 6'11", small forward. So he could play multiple. Not that Dominique couldn't. And not that Dominique... They didn't. had some good battles, by and the way. It was like... And of course, I'm not... I wasn't alive during their prime times. So when we look at those two, I would say I, I would love Dominique to watch. I would love to see him do all those highlight reels. But I would... I love that consistency of Larry. Yeah, absolutely. Do we got time for two more? Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, this or that, who would you pick? Uh, how about somebody else who's on the Dream Team, John Stockton, or would you pick Isaiah Thomas to build your team around? John Stockton. That guy does not get the credit he deserves. No, he doesn't. And he, most other people would have picked Isaiah at that time, though. But and, no, yeah. and like I, I said, Isaiah, I love Isaiah. But John Stockton is just one of those point guards that I go, he commanded the floor. He's not going to score a lot of points. And but I've, he could. He I've, could shoot the three. I heard opinions that if Stockton shot more, the Jazz may have beaten the Bulls in one of those finals that they competed against. Because he was possibly their best shooter, even though they had good shooters on mm -hmm. that team. He was and so player. that's where I'm like, John Stockton... Just with that, just constant general, constant. I mean, he did always wear those short shorts, so I'm like, no, dude, you gotta, gotta leave him in the past. But, like I said, he was a true point guard, something that we don't see today anymore, He's, and which is fair because the NBA's changed. But he, the pass was always correct. He always made the right decision. He was just there. And, you know, he was that extension of the coach on mm -hmm. the court you know uh jerry sloan was his coach excellent coach uh but john stockton like he's gonna do exactly what the coach wants wants on the court and he is the coach on the court sort of point guard how about you stockton or thomas i actually would take stockton as well just because i agree that he was underrated i think he was more of a team player less of an ego uh, blue collar, get to work sort of guy, and excellent three point shooter. I also think he is underrated. And when you play for a small market like Utah, mm -hmm. or you yeah. know, you play in Salt Lake City, you don't get that attention. And like I said, I would pick Isaiah in a heartbeat. But in that comparison, I just like John Stockton. And uh, how about one that uh, some of the last one, something uh, that some of our young fans might be a little more familiar with. How about uh, Michael Jordan? Would you pick Michael Jordan in his prime or LeBron James in his prime? Neither. Allen Iverson in his prime. <laughs> and here's why he's the best player ever. Okay, you let's, don't, let's hear it. Because, I mean, I, I think Allen Iverson's underrated as well. 
you never hear anyone else says, oh, I wish Jordan was seven foot, or I wish LeBron was seven, or like, or thank goodness they weren't seven foot. You hear constant from NBA players who played against Iverson, it's a great thing Iverson was six foot and not six six. Oh, Imagine yeah. if he had the height of a like true shooting guard and an NBA player, he would have just dominated with his like scoring attitude, with his uh, steals on defense. He wasn't the best one-on-one defender, but off-ball steals he was dominating with. Now, if He's I had the most a- passionate, he fought hard every play sort of player too. Mm-hmm. After watching the last dance and just kind of watching LeBron's career, that one is hard because I'm not going off their skills. Mm-hmm. At this point, we've seen enough debates and arguments about who's better. Well, they're both great at what they do. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at who would be the teammate I want. And while Jordan looked like a terrible teammate, he was always yelling at you, always um, trying to rub, like just create confrontation between him and his teammates to try to push him. He's like, I did it to push him, which fair, but you're always looking like the bad guy there. But LeBron has quit on his team multiple times. And that's true. I don't like that. I don't like the whole... You have to be pushed to play defense. Literally, there's a video of someone pushing LeBron to go play perimeter defense on someone. Yeah, like he had already given up on the play. And then there was always, and then you've got multiple instances in the playoffs too. And so I think, and because I don't like the whole athlete thinks they're better than the team. I don't like that at all. Mm -hmm. And Jordan kind of had the Jordan rules where I'm not practicing today. And while Iverson had the huge practice rant, Jordan did it quietly behind the scenes so people didn't realize it. Iverson just did it in front of national media. So you had the two type of things there. But I would say if I'm building a team, I would pick Jordan. I still would because he's got that two guard and Jordan had a better defensive mind. While I I say he was lucky to have Pippen and Rodman, Jordan was still very good at defense. And not that LeBron's not, but LeBron's kind of constantly pouting, constantly whining on the court. Off the court, I hear he's done some great things, and I would love for that to continue. But on court, even though I would hate how he would kind of split the locker room at times, I would go Jordan. Um, And I think most people also would go Jordan. There is that minority of people that says LeBron. But uh, at this point, I think we're probably ready for homework. And I think that it's uh, I think that it's kind of tough homework for some of you. But uh, I'll try to make it a little bit easier. Um, Every almost everybody agrees that Jordan's the greatest of all time, right? Actually, almost everybody. The vibes turning towards LeBron because he's current. See, now that's the thing. If you talk to people your age and people probably my age and older, Jordan. Uh But if you talk to anyone around my age and younger, it's LeBron. Because you've got to remember who is currently on TV, LeBron. So that's the one they see. That's the one they think. And LeBron is, like I said, he's up there with all the stats. So while I totally see where you're coming, but I I think in the people I talk to, LeBron's becoming the more favorite in that discussion. Interesting, because he's still doing it, and some people are starting to say Kevin Durant now. Well, so here, here's what I think for maybe homework is, uh, who do you think is the GOAT and why? Who's yeah. the greatest of all time? I like it. Is it Jordan? Is it LeBron? Is it somebody that we haven't even mentioned? Um, is it somebody that you think is up and coming? Do you think it's Kevin Durant? Do you think it's Steph Curry? I mean, some people might throw some random names out there. I'm kind of curious. And if you don't know basketball, you might not be able to get extra credit on this one. Yeah, I just pick a random name and explain. Langle. Well, I do have a highlight reel. I made that for when we played the Harlem Wizards. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so we should share that with the kids. <laughs> this is the wrap-up of the first part of The Dream, episode 18 i believe holy cow we're getting close to 20 so do that homework tell us this or that 
add your own this or that with your NBA players. This was a lot of fun episode. I can't wait to get into the actual games, the stats behind the players, and really see who dominated for the Dream Team. That's what we're doing for part two of the Dream Team. Part two, team. yep. Part two, we're going to start off with one of the, the only loss in Dream Team history. We'll go through the Barcelona games, and then we'll talk about their le- uh, legacy. Awesome. I like it. Until next time. Adios.